existence and self-sufficiency. And if you have your, your books, we start on page 19 there. Page 19 of your study notes. And so I think the easiest way to do this so you kind of get all the material is to kind of just go straight through the notes here and then kind of comment on it as we go. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, this isn't purely a lecture. Um, at least I hope it doesn't sound like that. Um, but that's what uh, Sunday School is for, is to interact and learn and ask questions and, and go through the material. Again, so last week, uh, Jason, thanks again for switching with me and doing the, the Trinity. I'm sure that by now, after going through that class, you know everything that there is to know about the Trinity. You understand it completely. There are no um, uh, no bewilderments in your mind about it. Everything is just clear, right? We're all good with that. I'm going to assume that so we can go. What's that? We, we're going to uh, assume that so that we can just uh, move forward, okay? I'm not going to go backwards on that. But it is uh, important to go through the Trinity uh, first before we start talking about the attributes. Now, why would that be? Any thoughts? Foundational. It's foundational. Yeah. First, we want to know uh, really who God is, right? As a as a uni unified God, three persons. Before we start diving into um, things uh, about Him or that He communicates uh, to us, okay? And so that's a good place to start. Uh, so what we know again of the Trinity is that there is how many gods and how many persons. Okay, good, Jason, you did your job. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm not sure you got much time. That's okay. That's okay. That's that's a pretty basic foundational thing that we want to know. So so let's start with Isaiah forty twenty five. Uh, to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal? says the Holy One. Okay. So what is God saying here to us in Isaiah in this verse? Well he's saying that there is none that you can liken me to. There's no one like me. Okay? Uh, there's no one that's my equal. Okay? None. He is uh, the uh, self-sufficient one, the self-existing one. And we'll talk again more about that here in just a few minutes. But there's no one you can equal uh, to him at all. Okay? No one else has that uh, unified presence of one God, three persons. Right? There are things that make us uh, up as a person. Right? We have flesh. We have a, a, a spirit. You know, and those kind of things. But there's no one like God in that way. And that's what he tells us. And he always reminds us of that. And we'll see that in all the verses that we go through. There's something very unique about this attribute right, that he keeps reminding us of. And that is we are not like him. Okay? In the uh, Young Families uh, community group that uh, we have here on uh, Tuesday nights, we've started going through apologetics. And one of the first things uh, that we go through in apologetics is this idea of a creature uh, creation distinction. Right? They're distinct. There's a line there. There's the creator, and then there's the creation. Okay? There, you don't uh, muddle those two. Right? And if you, you, as soon as you do, you mess up a lot of doctrine. Right? You mess up a lot of doctrine and get into a lot of heresy. But if you maintain that distinction, creator, creation, then I think you're on the right track. Right? And being able to understand some of these things. Uh, so Tozer says this, and if you haven't read uh, Tozer's book, which a lot of this material is based on, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic stuff. He says this, uh, Almighty God, just because He is Almighty, needs no support. The picture of a nervous uh, and uh, gratiating God fawning over men to win their favor is not a pleasant one, yet if we look at the popular conception of God, that is precisely what we see. 20th century Christianity has put God on charity. So lofty is our opinion of ourselves, that we uh, find it quite easy, not to say enjoyable, to believe that we are necessary to God, but the truth is that God is not greater uh, for our being, nor would He be less if we did not exist. That we do exist is altogether of God's free determination, not by our uh, desert, or, uh, desert nor by divine necessity. Uh, so basically what he's saying there is that uh, today, if, you've, if you think about it, God has been regulated to one of two things, really. Uh, a cruel uh, tyrant, right, who just does things because he's a mean God, right? Or the God is just like us. Like I said, they've mixed that creator uh, creation distinction, and we think that God is like us, right? So uh, we, we upset God, we do things to aggravate God, and because of that, the way we think about that, that God must be our equal, right? God needs us, right? He needs to be, he's dependent on how we react, 
right? Um, God looks down the tunnel of time, sees what we're going to do, and then kind of bases his will upon that, that kind of a thing. And that is not the way that the Bible describes uh, the God of the Bible. Oh, absolutely. Their gods were dependent on them. That's why you had to offer sacrifices and right. food. And otherwise, they wouldn't give you what you wanted, but they couldn't live without you. And they existed for your purpose. And so you would, you would negotiate, essentially, through sacrifice. Through absolutely. Suffering, worship, essentially, whether it be an equal or maybe a little bit better than that. That's, and that's a great point. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about that in a while. But uh, if you didn't hear what Jason said, the idea is that uh, Middle Eastern gods or uh, gods of pagan cultures they need their worshipers, right? It, it gives them self-satisfaction to have people doing things for them. They're dependent on that. Whereas we're going to see that even though God requires sacrifice, the God of the Bible requires sacrifice, and He asks us to do things, He is not dependent upon those things. Okay? He does it for a totally different reason, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Paul Washer, uh, The self-sufficiency of God is a declaration of His infinite greatness and His exalted place above His creation, all things depend on him for their very existence, and yet he depends upon no one. Now, in the beginning, if you remember two weeks ago when Nate Thompson was introducing uh, this class, we talked about a very important concept, and we're going to revisit that now since we're actually kind of diving into the attributes. Uh, really, the Trinity, right, is not so much an attribute. It's just kind of a description of who God is. But now we're going to get into attributes. And so uh, you have your notes there, so I'm not going to ask you if you remember this because it's cheating because you just know right there um, we talked about two different things uh, re regarding attributes the uh, communicable attributes and the incommunicable attributes right so quick definition what is a communicable attribute something that can be transferred something that can be communicated now we're not talking about communication like I'm speaking to you communicating but actually like transferred uh, given like we, we can share in that quality Okay, it's a similar quality. So then what would be an incommunicable attribute? The things that are only God. The things that are only God. That's a great, exactly, that's a great way to put it. The things that only belong to God, that only He possesses. Okay, so give me an example, for instance, of uh, something that's communicable. I'm going to mess that word up the more I say it, so just so you know. Love. Love, right? We have the capacity to love. We love people. Uh, we love ourselves uh, too much sometimes, but we have that capacity of love. So what's something then that's incommunicable? I'll give you a hint. We're looking at it this morning. Right? Self-existence and self-sufficiency. That is something that we do not possess on our own. Right? Only God has that um, attribute. Um, so I'm going to skip here a little bit uh, down through page 19. Uh, we get the idea of communicable attributes, but there's something very important that's in your notes that I want to talk about or at least read to you, and that's under the section on page 20 of incommunicable attributes. <coughs> incommunicable attributes are the attributes that God holds completely and for which we don't have anything similar in our existence. Okay. These are often difficult for us to understand since they are so beyond our understanding and experience. While God has revealed himself to us in such a way that we can begin to grasp his being, some aspects are just not within our realm of understanding, at least not to any significant degree. So we have this brief caution here. When considering incommunicable attributes, these are abstract concepts that we will have difficulty comprehending. Okay? You, can, you can get there to a point. I think you can understand a basic concept, but to fully comprehend what's going on there, we just can't. Because why? We're not infinite. right? We, we don't have these qualities. Right? So when you uh, have a, a friend who's going through something, you can kind of empathize with them. Um, you know, if, uh, if it's a miscarriage, for instance, if you've had a miscarriage, you can kind of know what that person's going through, right? You understand some of the emotions that happen. In an attribute like this, which one of us can say that, that we're completely self-independent, uh, self-sufficient? None of us can say that. So that's where this idea of uh, difficulty of comprehending comes in. This means we must be careful where we tread. Okay? We make a lot of uh, big mistakes. A lot of error has come about when we try to um, uh, dive into things and make assumptions about things that the Bible, quite frankly, either hasn't told us um, or that we try to jump to conclusions to about, you know, uh, above what the Bible has told us. Uh, our natural tendency is to rationalize them into our understanding. We call that putting God into a box, right? You've heard that expression? We put God into a box. We say, this is how God should be. This is what he should look like. Fits all neatly, kind of like this. 
and then this is who God is to us. Um, now, this rationalizing can help us grasp the concept, but taken too far, we begin to ascribe more to God than He is revealed. That's huge. We ascribe more to God than He is revealed. When we start putting motives to God, for instance, because God has this attribute, we say, well, because He has this attribute, He must be this way. Right? If the Bible hasn't told us that, we're jumping to conclude. We're ascribing something that He hasn't said yet. Okay? With any attribute, there will be a tension where each attribute is held and exercised by God as one. God is one being who shows different characteristics of His being. No single characteristic is more important than any other. And this is something that Nate hit upon two weeks ago. You don't want to take the attribute of love and make it above everything else, right? Because then you have a problem with some other doctrine. Likewise, you want to take the fact that God is just and put that above everything else because then you have a problem with doctrine. That's the neat thing about God that you'll find out in this class, that every attribute that God has, He holds in perfect balance. None of us can do that, except for God, right? None of us can do that. And you think about it. If you're angry, right, Robin Conwell talks about uh, this in his parenting class, if you're angry, that consumes every other emotion. It robs everything else. But with God, right, he can be angry and loving at the same time. It's an, it's an amazing thing, okay? He can command things that he wants us to do and be self-sufficient at the same time, okay? None of us can do that. It's very important to realize that. Uh, the attributes of God are bite-sized views into His mind, so we must be careful to let God determine and describe Himself as He decides is best. And what He has said, we accept, even if we can't quite fit it in the box. Okay, That's another very important thing as we're going through this. Uh, that's why we said that we're going to go through uh, this material. We have quotes by Pink and uh, Tozer and, and Groom and Hodge and all these guys who are very brilliant men. At the end of the day, our best resource for knowing God is what? The Bible. Okay? That's our biggest source. Okay? And so what we're called to do in something in Scripture is if we don't understand it, we still are called to believe it. Right? I don't understand everything the Bible tells me. But I'm called to believe it. Right? That's what we turn these for. We'll, we'll get those answers at some point. So again, we determine, or I'm sorry, God determines how He describes Himself as He thinks is best. And what He has said is best is what He has told us. Right? God has not given us any useful or useless information in the Bible. He has not told us or not told us something we need to know that He hasn't told us. Right? Okay. So there you go. There's your cautious warning. Because as we're going through this, um, and you think about it, if you ever laid awake at night and you thought about uh, heaven or eternity, it scares me. I don't know about you guys, but it just freaks me out because it's so much bigger than I am. Right? All right. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. So be cautious, but don't be afraid to know God as He is. Okay, so what does it mean for God to be self-existent? Now, when I was going through the notes this week, my first thought was, it seems like pretty basic stuff, right? And at the same time, we're thinking, as I go through it, I'm like, it's not basic. It's not basic at all. The concepts are, are there, but, uh, but what it means is, is not basic. Um, the idea conveyed by self-existence is sometimes called God's aseity. Okay? Aseity. That's on 20 there, under that, uh, about halfway through the page. A seity, from the Latin words a, c, meaning from himself. So a, from, and then c, himself. And then iti, whatever that means. Uh, essentially, we look at Scripture and we see God having always existed from eternity past to eternity future. Now, right here is a stumbling block for our minds. Okay? We think of things completely linear. Okay? Unless you're a Buddhist or something, then you think of things circular. But we think of things linear. Most people do. Okay, We think of things that has a beginning. We think of things that have an end. Okay? So the first problem we run into in this attribute, trying to understand it, is the fact that uh, God has existed uh, prior to time, and He will exist after time has ended into eternity. And if your heads explode, I won't be offended. I'll just, like, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. So basically it's this. There was never a time when God did not exist he is the uncaused cause of all that we see and understand. Okay? That's important, too. Not just all that we see, right? We look at a mountain, and we teach our kids, who made that mountain? They say, well, God made the mountain. You're right. But even the things that we understand, well, how do you know that that's a mountain? Right? How do you know that that's a mountain? Well, somebody told them that that was a mountain. Right? Daddy told me that was a mountain. Well, how did Daddy know that was a mountain? Well, somebody told him that was a mountain. And you get all the way back, well, how do you know that's a mountain? Because God told us that that was a mountain. 
Right? So it all becomes uh, comes from somewhere. So again, let's go to God's descriptions of Himself regarding to uh, when He existed. Uh, the first one, obviously, is a very obvious one. I said obvious twice there, I realize that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, logically from that statement, what do you have to presuppose there? That's right. That's one thing. That there was a time when there was no heaven and no earth. What's the other thing you have to presuppose there? Absolutely. God existed before all these things that he created. Right? He couldn't have been a created being and then created these things. Right? Because it was in the beginning. Right? In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Presupposing that before the heavens and the earth were created, God was there. Uh, Psalm 92. Uh, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Okay? So before creation again, he's telling us, I was there. Okay, I was there. And it's very interesting to think about. I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but when you think about that, he's saying I was there as a, as a place, not necessarily a time thing, because he was there before time. Right? He just, he just was. He just is. Right? It's, 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 it's fascinating to think about. Uh, Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. The first and the last. Okay, That's the key there in that, in that verse. I am the first. I am the last. And then he uh, actually kind of repeats that here in Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Right? Yeah, for those of you who know anything about Greek at all, what's the first letter of the Greek alphabet? What's the last letter of the Greek alphabet? Okay, so he's using that, that, that paradigm there to show you that. Uh, I am the beginning, I am the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay. Now those three uh, moments, characteristics, descriptions, whatever you want to call them, who is, currently is, who was, he always was, and who is to come, right? Who always will be, right? All three of those things he spans. That's Revelation. What's that? And and he's the Almighty, right? The Almighty, right? Exactly. And and the fact that he is, well, I won't get. I'm going to steal anybody's thunder, but the next classes that are coming up, that's the Almighty part comes in, because he's self-existent, he can do these things. Sure we are. And we're trying to describe infinity and eternity with time words. And it just doesn't work. Yeah, you're right. That's say before time. Oh, wait, that's a time word. That's right. That's right. And even unending is a time word, right? We're, we're measuring something by the fact that it doesn't, it just keeps, like, linear, it keeps going. What's interesting about that point is uh, if you read uh, uh, the Institutes by Calvin, one of the great things that Calvin uh, says uh, or communicates to us is that God speaks to us in baby speak. That's how God talks to us, as if we are babies, right? Because He is so far above, so far removed from who we are as, as creation, right? The only way that we're going to know anything about Him is if He talks to us like we're babies. Baby speak. For that very reason. We can't, we can't conceptualize that. Right? Like I said, it freaks me out at night when I think about it. Okay? Now, like my wife, um, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. She has this, this fear of like the wide open ocean. Right? Freaks her out to see the big wide open ocean. And one of the reasons that's so is because it's so much bigger than she is. Like I can't comprehend. Like there's, I can go forever and I won't get anywhere. Right? That's, the, that's kind of the idea. So it's a good point. Good point. Uh, but again, God has given us words, right, to understand these things. So we say we don't understand time, yet God invented time. He told us what time is, right, so he can communicate those things to us. We can actually have a, at least a, a small idea of what he's talking about, right? He created language. It's a, it's a neat thing. Uh, then Job, uh, who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. That's cool, right? Who is that I should pay him? Who do I owe anything to? Right? I don't look at the mountain and say, I'm so glad that you created that because they're mine. I did that. Right? 
Now, sometimes it's much easier for attributes like this to consider what they are not instead of what they are. When we look at ourselves and the world around us, we see everything has an origin. Nothing in our universe is permanent. Everything started at a particular time and continues to grow or die. We had a beginning when we were born. We observe with our telescopes the birth of stars. Even our secular scientists agree that the universe began with some colossal explosion, which we know is actually the fringes of God's demonstrated power on the first day. Uh, we live in a universe of cause and effect. Everything has some pre-existing cause that brought it about, but the ultimate cause of everything is God himself. Now, I've always find that interesting, right, whether you talk with people who uh, believe in evolution or the big, big Bang theory or whatever it is. Now, that they even have to admit that at some point something didn't exist and something caused it to exist. Now, they attribute that obviously uh, wrongly to what caused that to exist. But even they have to admit that there was nothing that was just always here. Something caused it. Right? And we believe as, as Christians that that something is God. Okay? But they even acknowledge that. And it's interesting when you talk to people that um, when they say things like that that are true, right, that something caused the universe, well, how can they say that? Right? They're not Christians. Well, it's because they steal from the Christian worldview, don't they? Right? They have to. There's no, there's no way around that. Okay? And that's what uh, Paul talks about in Romans, that they knew these things, and then they just changed about where they got it from. Right? They didn't give thanks to God, yet God's the one that told them these things. Okay? It's pretty remarkable. Um, but this is not so with God. So what he's saying is that everything has a cause, but God does not have a cause. He simply always has been. There was never a time, if we can call it that, to your point, when God was not. We are created by God, but God is not created by anything. Genesis 1.1 begins with the foregone conclusion that God already existed before time and the universe. From everlasting to everlasting, explains Moses in Psalm 90. In other words, no matter how far you look back, you will always see God. You won't always see man or even this universe, but you are guaranteed to see God. It is God's nature to exist. God was never caused. No situation came about to bring God into being. He is just and He, as He always has been. Fascinating, isn't it? Rhetorical question of the study notes. It's true. We don't even come close to having a mental category for this type of existence. We can't think of it that way. Think of the fact that you know we know that we were born. God was not born. He was not caused. Uh, we know there was a moment of time when God had planned out all of our days. Right? There was no plan of days for God. He always existed. He was there. Right? So it's, uh, it's fascinating. A.A. Uh, a. Hodge, who was only second to Charles, uh, absolute, when applied to the being of God, signifies that he is an internal, self-existent person who existed before all other things and is the intelligent and voluntary cause of whatever else has or will exist in the universe, that he sustains, consequently, no necessary relation to any without, outside of himself. God is what he is because he is, and he wills whoever he does, or I'm sorry, whatsoever he does, will because it seemeth good in his sight. He sustains um, everything that he has created. He's the only person in, in the universe that can do that. Actually created all things. I think it was R.C. Sproul one time that said that if there was even one single atom, some molecule out there that was outside of God's uh, control, outside of his existence, that kind of was apart from him, that uh, we would have no confidence in anything that he's told us because that one thing could wreck everything that he's done, chain reaction-wise, right? And that's not the case. God has created everything, every molecule. He sustains everything. And He uh, is what He is because He is. It sounds like a self-authenticating um, statement, but it's the truth. He is. Yeah, exactly. Don't jump ahead of me. You know, you, you've done this before. You know the notes. That's not fair. Uh, pink. In the beginning, God. There was a time, again, if time is what it could be called, when God in all the unity of His nature though subsisting equally in three divine persons, let's not forget the Trinity from last week, dwelt all alone. In the beginning, God, there was no heaven, where His glory is now uh, particularly manifested. There was no earth to engage His attention. There were no angels to Him as praises. There was uh, no universe to be upheld by the word of His power. There was nothing, no one but God, and that, not for a day, a year, or an age, but from everlasting. 
During a past eternity, God was alone. Doesn't mean he was lonely, like singing songs to himself, right? All by myself, that song. He wasn't, it wasn't that, that he was just alone. There was nothing else, nothing else. Uh, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-satisfied, in need of nothing. And that becomes very important as we move on here in a little bit. He had a universe, or I'm sorry, had a universe, had angels, had human beings been necessary to him in any way, they also had been called into existence from all eternity. Uh, the creating of them when he did added nothing to God essentially. That's important. It added nothing to God essentially. Because I know there's going to be a question probably that comes up here in a few minutes, so I want you to remember that. He changes not, Malachi 3 tells us. Therefore, his essential glory can neither be augmented or diminished. Good? Okay. Then on to Grudem. God's being is also something totally unique. And this is what I was talking about in the very beginning that we had to remember. The difference between the creature and the creator is an immensely vast difference. For God exists in a fundamentally different order of being. It is not just that we exist and God has always existed. It is also that God necessarily exists in an infinitely better, stronger, more excellent way. The difference between God's being and ours is more than the difference between the sun and a candle, more than the difference between the ocean and a raindrop, more than the difference between the Arctic ice cap and a snowflake, more than the difference between the universe and the room we are sitting in. God's being is qualitatively different. What were those things before? The analogy you brought before. You can put a snowflake to the Arctic ice cap. They're all created things. They're all created things. But isn't it in it's in quantity. Right? Notice that this is bolded for a reason. Qualitatively different. So it's not like comparing a snowflake to a glacier, right? You can't do that. Because eventually, if you have enough snowflakes and they last for a long enough time, you can come up with a glacier, okay? But if you have enough of us, enough of our being, you'll never come up to God, okay? Hence why Mormonism is wrong, okay? We don't become God like they think Jesus became God. It's, it's a, a qualitatively different thing, okay? Not just a quantitatively different thing. No limitation or imperfection in creation should be projected onto our thought of God. This is putting God into a box again, that, that sentence. He is the creator. All else is creaturely. All else can pass away in an instant. He necessarily exists forever. Okay? Do you catch that? No limitation or imperfection should be projected onto God. And what that means is uh, we don't think of God in human terms. Okay? We don't project things onto God because we think that they're true. We take what God has told us is true and then comprehend them, or at least try. So you're saying that God has always been around. That's what the notes say, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. God has always been around. Uh, but open your mind to the implications of this. If God has always existed, then He is in Himself completely self-sufficient. Okay, so there's two parts to this attribute really, right? Self-existence, right? He's always existed. But then the second part of this is self-sufficiency, right? Okay, if you have a baby and you leave that baby out in the wilderness, what happens to that baby eventually? It dies. Why? <laughs> right. that's, that's, yeah, that's uh, Tarzan. This is not um, the Bible, okay? If, assuming there's no people or lions and tigers and bears on I, the baby dies, Right? And why does the baby die? No one to care for it. The baby is dependent on someone, right? Okay. So it's enough to be, that baby can, can, can self-exist for a while, but it's not self-sufficient, thus it will stop self-existing. Okay. I know it's really philosophical, I apologize, but you get that idea, right? It can exist, but it can't keep existing because it's not sufficient. That's what makes this attribute so amazing. God has always existed um, because he has always been self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything else to keep him alive. He doesn't need anything else to keep him going. Right? It's not something that he's, he's going to run out of. Right? He's not going to run out of food. He's not going to rest. He doesn't need any of that. He is self-sufficient in and of himself. This means that God is in need of nothing. It is true that God did create and that God is active within his creation. However, nothing created nor anything exists adds or changes anything about God's character or essence. 
So basically that means if God had never created anything, he wouldn't be any different. Okay? God is absolutely independent and self-sufficient in himself. So not only does he exist, has always existed, he has always been self-sufficient. And here's what God says about it. This is what uh, Jason was getting to here a moment ago. Uh, Exodus 3. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, that seems like a very simple thing to say, doesn't it? All right? Didn't Popeye say something like that? I don't know what that was. I am who I am. Something like that. Yeah, I am who I am. Okay, he's not Popeye. Okay? Let's just get that out of the way right now. Yeah, no problem, Jason. That was for you. Uh, the single verse says so much. God alone can say that he is because he has always been and always will be. Can okay, you think about Moses from a human perspective as we're having this conversation, right? And he says, Moses, I am who I am. And Moses is like, uh, what? <laughs> I, I don't get it. Of course, God revealed to him what that means. But you think about it. I am who I am. Oh, okay, well, who are you? And God says, no, that's, that's who I am. I am who I am. And what he means in that verse, and, and what does that mean, I am who I am? Can I ask a question? I don't want to interrupt your flow. Nothing too hard. That, that statement comes when Moses says, who shall I say sent you? Mm -hmm. And God says, I am who I am. So it's like God is naming himself, not describing himself. There you go. You answered my question with your question. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> so what does, that, what, does that, what does that tell you? When he says, I am who I am, what is he telling Moses? That's right. He's everything. He's everything. And he's so the word. He is the word. The word was there be after him. Right. But before him also. And right. he said, I am. Right. So to answer your question, a name in the Old Testament is not just an identification. It's a characteristic. It's that's right. Are you. So when you were naming, that's why we have all these crazy names, right? They name this place after God blessed me by the river or something, right? And it's like a long name. Because they want to capture the essence. They want to capture the person, uh, the being, the event, whatever else. So when he says, who should I say sent me? God's not just giving an identification. Just tell him, hey, God said, he's telling him, here's the essential characteristic that I want you to communicate to my people. This is the name. This is what sums me up. This is what summarizes who I am. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why he chooses a characteristic, not just an identification. And yeah. Then, and didn't it describe kind of what Pharaoh saw? What, I mean, yeah, I yeah. That, because I don't think even I, I, Moses had no idea when he went into Egypt. I mean, he just came with the message from God. That's right. But he Moses even began to see the power of God um, portrayed before, before Pharaoh, right? Yeah, and that comes, that comes on later, right? Okay. But if you go back to Jason's point, it is interesting to think about. When Moses says, who shall I say sent me? He could have just said, well, duh, tell him that God sent you. <laughs> right? But he doesn't do that. He says, I am who I am. And that word, okay, that name, so let me correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, I think I'm okay on this one, is Yahweh. I am. So what God is telling Moses, what he reveals to him right then, is his covenant name. And that goes to Jason's point. That's what Jason was talking about. He wasn't just saying, I'm God and I'm sending you. He's saying, I'm Yahweh. Right? And when he says, I am Yahweh, he's saying, I am the covenant God who promised to deliver you guys out of Egypt, and I will do so because I can, because I've always existed. All those things are wrapped up in that, in that name Yahweh, and there's so many more. We're, we would never even exhaust all of it. But that's what he's telling us. I am who I am. I am Yahweh. I am the one who has always existed, who always will exist, and will deliver you. That's what he's telling us. And it's interesting, if you, if you read through it, kind of a side note here, this is the first time, I believe, that God actually reveals His name to someone. His covenant name to someone, right? A lot of people knew who God was before this, but this is the first time that God is actually taking the next step and, and, and formally, um, in a loving way, introducing Himself as the all-sufficient, all-existent God to Moses. It's fascinating. So it's more than just telling them God sent you. Okay, He's telling something... A great deal more than that. Okay. Uh, there was never a time when God was other than He is now. From eternity past to eternity future, God will always be as He is now. God never will become anything, and He never was anything. Does that make sense? 
He is complete in himself and nothing, not time, not creation, changes or adds to who he is. Compare this with Paul, word, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul is what he has become. Sorry, Paul is what he has become because of the work of God in his life, right? He became Paul because God saved him and changed his heart. But God is what he is because he just is, without any effort or external input. God is a self-sufficient being and needs not anything from without himself to support himself or to make himself happy. Okay, here's where I get into some weeds a little bit here. His existence is not owing to any nor has he received any assistance or support from any. Being self-existent, he must be self-subsistent. As he existed of himself and subsisted in of, and of himself millions and millions of ages, even an eternity inconceivable to us alone, before any other existed, he must be self-sufficient. And all those words are saying is that he exists because he is able to exist, and he is able to exist because he exists. Okay? That's all it's saying. He is self-existent because he is able to sustain himself forever that's all it's saying leave it to john gill right uh, god's existence is completely within him for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son to have life in himself john five twenty six. notice that he has life in himself okay so when you think about all the stuff that's going on in our culture and uh, uh, i was reading the other day and, and paul might know more about this than i do um, didn't they just create like a uh, an artificial womb or something? Did somebody read something about that? I heard that I thought, or they created something that they thought could sustain life, or you know they've been working on cloning sheep and all this stuff, right? They can they can do those things, but you know the one thing that they can't do, they can't give it life. They don't know what causes that spark of of life. They can put cells together, they can do all that, but they can't give it life, right? Because they can't give it the the, the breath of the spirit, right? They can't create life. And yet here, it's an amazing statement, for the Father has life in Himself. He is life. He has it in Himself. He doesn't need anybody to give it to Him. I go on to Acts. God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands, as though He needed anything, since He gives life, or I'm sorry, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. Right? We need to build a temple because God needs a place to live. No, He doesn't. We need to build a temple because God's required you to give sacrifices. Right? Not because He needs a place to live. He doesn't need a roof over His head. Okay? We enjoy life because God granted it to us. But God's life is inherent to Himself. The great I Am needs nothing. The life He possesses, He has in Himself. Simple but profound. Okay? So we're saying that God doesn't need anything, right? Nothing is added to him by creating. So the next question is logically what? Well, why then did he create anything? Right? If he was self-sufficient, self-existent for all eternity, what made him decide to do this? Why are we sitting in this room this morning? Okay, that's the question. The notes say this, but doesn't God have a purpose for creation? Are we really just kind of walking around aimless like you know, God just decided he was bored one day and created something and left it alone, and you know, here we are? No. Okay? His purpose has nothing uh, to do with his self-existence or self-sufficiency, meaning it's not dependent upon it. Uh, so, doesn't God have a purpose for creation? Yes, he does. But it's not for companionship or any of the other concepts often preached from the modern-day pulpit. It has been argued that God created man and the universe because he needed to demonstrate his glory or he needed to share his being with others? Okay. No. Okay. No. He, doesn't, he didn't create man because he was, again, lonely. He didn't create man because he wanted companionship. Okay. Does God want to glorify himself? Absolutely. Did he need to show that glory to anybody else? No. He's not vain. He didn't need to do that. He chooses to do that, but he didn't need to do that, and that's the difference. Okay. Uh, the creation does, by all means, demonstrate His care and glory. However, we must stop for far short of going anywhere near the words God needs. These two words should never appear together. So we should edit this book and write them out. Uh, the idea that there is something outside of God and that He needs to add to Himself is absolutely foolish and unbiblical. That's a harsh word if you think about what the Bible says regarding fools, right? 
but it's foolish. It's silly, and it's heretical, quite honestly. No one has ever contributed to God something that he did not receive first from God himself. I want to just you know, give God all the glory. Well, where would you get it from? I just want to offer my body as a sacrifice of praise. Well, where would you get it from? You know, I just want to do these things for God. Well, who gave you the ability to do them? Right? All these things we, we kind of talk about in our Christianese, we kind of forget that God's the one that's enabling us to do all these things. Right? Yeah. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Exactly. What exactly are you going to give me? Yeah. What what significant thing are you going to give to me since I created you and everything that you have? Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, his creation is purely an act of his own sovereign will. He is under no constraint, obligation, or pressure to do anything. Right. You talk. I've, I've uh, some atheist people that I know or knew in the past, and one of the things that I always heard was. Well, if God loves me, then He needs to, or, you know, God really should do. No, He doesn't. He is not obligated to do anything, right? So we start talking later on, and again, still people center. We talk later on uh, in upcoming classes about, um, well, you know, if God was all good, then He wouldn't do such and such, or He wouldn't have hated Esau, or whatever it is. Well, He can do whatever He wants, okay? Because the fact that they're even able to utter those words is because He gives them breath to utter them. Self-existent, self-sufficient. So any complaint against him or anything that we think he needs is just foolishness. Psalm 50. Um, and, and here you go, Jason. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Using an analogy, obviously, God doesn't get hungry like we get hungry. His point is, look, even if I were hungry, what are you going to give me that I can't just create out of thin air in the first place? Right? Ice cream. Exactly. Not even ice cream. So likewise, you, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Now, that's used in a different context a lot of the time, but you think about that. God says, you know what, I want you to do these things. And we do them. We're like, didn't we do a good job for you, God? No, you did what I told you to do. You didn't add anything to me for it, right? You obeyed me of, of the things that I gave you to obey. Right? We're unprofitable. We didn't add anything to your existence. Okay? That's what we should say. Let's look 17. Everything was created by God, and he sits over it as king. God could will to create a whole new universe, and it wouldn't begin to cause him Difficulty. He could do it all over again, a million times over again. No problem. There is nothing that God would, could not create, and therefore nothing that He could possibly de be dependent upon. Uh, even human beings in all their glory, even when obedient, add nothing to God. They are still just unprofitable servants at best, since we don't add anything to God. Remember Jesus' rebuke to the Pharisees, For I say to you that God is able to raise up the children, or I'm sorry, Raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Nothing holds sway over God. Nothing can influence him but his kind will and intentions. Okay. Now, don't hear me wrong. We'll talk about this here in a second. I'm not saying that God views us as worthless. I'm saying that we don't add anything to him. Okay. Our value is not constrained in what we can add to God. It's the fact that God created us. That's our value. But what about His glory? Doesn't God need creation to demonstrate His glory? No. He doesn't. Consider Jesus' words in His high priestly prayer for the church before His crucifixion. And now, O Father, glorify me together with Yourself with the glory which I had with You before the world was. Father, I desire that they also whom You gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which You have given me, for You loved me before the foundation of the world. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that there was a glory that existed before God created anything and showed it to anybody. And that's what Jesus prays here. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay, so go back to the Trinity. Why in the world would we talk about the Trinity before talking about this topic? There's a really big heresy a long time ago that is the, the reason for that. Where they were um, separate. That they, right. That God was separate and Jesus was separate. 
Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. That the big one was that that Jesus was a created being. I'm sorry. Arianism. Yeah, Arianism. Okay. That the the belief that that Jesus was God. He kind of became God. He was kind of like a demigod. But even he had a beginning. And what Jesus bring here is like no. He had glory with the Father before. Okay. So don't get confused in your mind. So we say, well, wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus born as a human? Yeah. He had a a human start point, right? He, he compressed himself and uh, was, was born as a man, okay? But that didn't mean he didn't exist prior to that. All right, one of my biggest pet peeves, uh, soapbox here for a minute, is the fact that we treat Jesus like he just kind of showed up in the New Testament, right? All of a sudden, it's this mean, evil father God, father God, father God, and all of a sudden, you get to the New Testament, oh, Jesus, he's a really nice guy, okay? Jesus existed in the Old Testament, okay? He's all over the place. I won't get into that now. It's not this class. But he existed, and Paul even tells us that the, the, he existed because he created the world. It was through the Son that the world was created, right? Again, going back to the very beginning, he couldn't have done that if he didn't exist yet, right? Pure logical impossibility. But the point here is that he had glory with the Father before the world was. Before any glory was demonstrated to anyone, their glory existed, and it was shared among them, the persons of the Trinity. Okay? He didn't need to do that to show it to anybody, but he did. God has always, before the world was, possessed glory within himself. Again, he doesn't derive glory. He possesses it and then bestows it. If that makes sense. We'll talk about that. Now, further, further, there has always existed, before the foundation of the world, a perfect love between the persons of the Trinity. Now, if you didn't learn about the Trinity, this sentence wouldn't make any sense to you, right? Hence the reason why he did the Trinity before here. The universe most definitely was not created because God lacked anything in him or because he just had to share his excellencies with men. It wasn't show and tell time for God. Right? Some people just need to tell you something because they want to share it with you. He didn't need that. He was perfectly fine keeping it to himself if he wanted to do that. Uh, God was glorious even when there was no one to see it. <laughs> That's a remarkable statement, I think. He was glorious even when no one was around to see it. And he had perfect love and harmony within himself long before men were invited to partake of such things. Again, Paul Washer here. One of the most awe-inspiring and humbling truths about God is that he is absolutely free from any need or dependence. His existence, the fulfillment of his will, and his happiness or good pleasure do not depend on anyone or anything outside of himself. He is the only being who is truly self-existent, self-sustaining, self-sufficient, independent, and free. All other beings derive their life and blessedness from God. But all that is necessary for God's existence and perfect happiness is found in Himself. God has not lack or need and is dependent upon no one. To teach or even suggest that God made man because He was lonely or incomplete is absurd and even blasphemous. Creation is not the result of some lack in God, but the result of His fullness or the overflow of His abundance. To teach that God somehow needs help uh, to make things run rightly in the world is equally absurd and blasphemous. He did not create because he had a need, but because he desired to make known the abundance, or I'm sorry, the superabundance of his perfections, glory, and goodness. So if God is so self-sufficient in himself, where does that leave us? Well, the natural answer is what? That we are not self-sufficient, that we are dependent, even though he is independent. Okay? So if God is self-existent and self-sustaining, we are not. That's where that leaves us. And why? Because of that creator-creature distinction that we talked about. So here's the balance to this doctrine. While we see gods of this world desiring praise and worship and sacrifice, to your point earlier, Jason, to which man oddly worship that which acts just as they, right? think about that for a minute. We worship what, what we think we're just like, right? because we think we're owed it. The God of the Bible is sufficient in his own person. Though it adds nothing to him, he still shares his glory with his people. And that's a remarkable practical application for this morning, I think. He doesn't need to share his glory, but he chooses to do so. Okay? He still shares his glory with his people. He doesn't need to do it, but he does. And we as his people, though obedient, I'm sorry, through obedient belief, magnify God's glory and bring him joy. In other words, while God is outside of creation, he's still very much interested and active within it. So this means that when you say magnify His glory, we're not saying that we're, we're creating glory somehow and then ascribing it to Him. 
what we're doing is we're taking the magnifying glass and seeing what's already there and showing other people. That's what magnifying means, right? If you take a magnifying glass, you put it uh, uh, on the sidewalk, and it just doesn't appear, doesn't create it, right? You just magnify what's already there. And that's what it means to magnify His glory, okay? Good so far? I see some puzzled looks. Are we good? Okay. Talk to me afterwards, or actually talk to Jesus. Yeah, I know. If you walk out here going, that's, that's probably a good thing, okay? <laughs> not through the service, though. We are not meaningless creations. This is what I was talking about earlier. Okay, Our value isn't found because we give something to God. Our value is found in every human being because God created it. The Internet is full of people wondering what makes themselves important. Okay, Facebook. I want to put myself out there and show everybody how important I am. It's not necessarily an evil in and of itself, but you know, that's, that's kind of the point, right? We want people to see us. Okay? iPhone. <laughs> okay? Have it your way. All these things. We, we think that we're uh, kind of the king of the hill. What's that? Selfie sticks. Selfie sticks. Yeah, exactly. That's, um, I can't even find something that wants to take a picture of me. I'll just do it myself. Okay? Many invent their own reasons for importance and relevance. But the truth is that God has created us because He wanted to create us. We are meaningful not because of some need in God, but because God has decided that we are meaningful. I'm sorry, that God has decided that we are meaningful. God, who is outside of time and space, in need of nothing, possessing absolute joy and happiness within Himself, has decided that we are important to Him. Here we find our true significance. Though we are not needed, God desires us to be close to Him. Okay? So we're not. Not really. Not really. I, I desire, uh, what's a good thing? This? I desire to have melting pot every week. Okay? I don't need it. But I desire it. And that sounds really good right now. Um, there's a difference between desire and need, right? Need is something that you're dependent upon. Desire is just a want. Okay? Just a want. It's like you have uh, kids, right? Um, but Daddy, I need this. No, you don't. You want this. You don't need it. You need food. Okay? That's right. That's right. I need uh, I need to be online. I need to, to be on Facebook. No, you don't. You want to be on there. Okay. But actually, that's a good point. That difference between desire and need and want are going to be very important mm-hmm. for people. Because when we talk about all these attributes working together, what God desires versus what He brings to pass will have a difference. And if you think that need and desire are the same thing, you're going to have some really struggles trying to understand how these things go together. So if you have to understand that there's a desire, here's what God desires for men, and here's what he brings to pass, that's going to help you unlock the things that you're supposed to be telling them. For instance, does God desire our obedience? Absolutely he does. Does he need it? He can glory either way, one way or the other. Uh, so remember that since God is sufficient in himself, nothing forces his hand. All of God's decisions are completely free and based on his own desires. God desires to have a people for himself. And this people is important to God. He is not distant from them, but near. So near that he has an emotional bond with them uh, in such a way that we can bring joy to God. Uh, There is a God who desires our good and takes pains to secure it. That's the neat thing about the God of the Bible, right? Every other God in every other religion is a tyrant. They do things because they think they're owed it. Okay? The God of the Bible creates and desires to be with us because he just wants to. (laughs) He doesn't need to. And to think about this self-existent and self-sufficient God who's always existed and we're but a, not even a speck in, in, in time, if you call it that, eternity, has desired that, uh, to make us and to draw them or to draw us to himself, that's amazing. That's amazing. He didn't have to create anything. We don't have to be here and he would still be perfectly happy and perfectly content and self-sufficient and that he chose to do these things. Okay? We're almost done here. I know we're late, but we started late. So it's your fault. Uh, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation is a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all your kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land be any more termed desolate, but you shall be called I'm not even going to try that one. In your land, Belua. For the Lord delights in you. 
the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. And wait, is that land or hand? Sorry, on my glasses. Land, okay. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your um, sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The Lord delights in you. This God who doesn't need anything, doesn't need to create, doesn't need to have vainglory thrust upon him, desires and delights in you. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And this, is, this verse is going to be very important as we come to the love of God here in a few weeks. Um, I want to forego this last paragraph and just kind of comment on my own here. The idea that God is self-sufficient and self-existent and the fact that we are not, and you think about how many people have existed, how many people exist now, how many more people will exist, uh, how every flower out in the field, how every bird in the air is dependent upon one being who is self-sufficient uh, and self-existent, and he sustains them all. Okay? I think I'm a very busy person. Okay? I, I, it's all the time, running around. There's things to do with the kids. There's a dinner here to go to. There's overtime. I can't keep track of everything. Yeah, God, yeah. God keeps everything going. Feeds everything that needs to be fed. Grows people who need to be grown, right? I mean, He does it all because He's self-sufficient. Now think about that. If He wasn't self-sufficient, self-existent, a lot of His time would be spent sustaining Himself, Right? He would need to do that to live. Okay? He doesn't. Thus, he is free to do that for us. It's a remarkable thing. Uh, any questions that are really short and I can answer with a yes or no? <laughs> Good. Okay. The glory and attribute of God. I'm sorry? The glory and attribute of God. Uh, I think it's a result of attributes. It's a result of attributes. Can we say, well, God is glorious. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, he's glorious because um, he saves people. He's glorious because he executes justice. He's glorious because he created. So I feel like um, one is derived from the other. Uh, I've never read anywhere, unless maybe you have, that they attribute gloriness as a separate attribute. I think they're all involved in glory somehow. Well, it seems to be something that has to be held, not mm -hmm. something that has to be determined. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we're making categories here, right? I mean, that's the best we can do. Um, that's why you have all these attributes of God books. We're like, we're trying to just make sense of who God is, and He's love, and well, He's He's also just, and and they all are are together. I mean, there's there's glory in all. Mm -hmm.